Welcome to the Jolly Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Barrett. This podcast is for those who are interested in the conversation around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Each week, I'll be interviewing a guest who has something special to share or is actively part of building solutions in the space. Let's get started. Welcome to the Jolly Podcast, where we explore stories of resilience, innovation, and empowerment. We are always putting our lens on diversity, equity, and inclusion because it's in everything we do. I'm your host, Melissa Barrett, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to a remarkable guest today, Lester Patrick. Lester has spent over 40 years as a federal employee working for three federal agencies as a senior telecommunications specialist, information technology management specialist, and a technical security officer. Throughout his career, he has designed, developed, tested, and implemented national communication systems, leaving an indelible mark on federal communications and technology infrastructure. Lester's educational background, equally impressive, holds an undergraduate degree from North Carolina, advanced degrees from Golden Gate University, Pepperdine University, and professional certifications from Cisco Systems and George Washington University. His expertise spans across telecommunications, IT management, and technical security. But his impact doesn't stop there. Lester is also a commissioner for the Housing Authority of the County of San Joaquin. That's where I live. He's also a member of the California Association of Housing Authorities, or CAHA, covering all housing authorities throughout California. And he serves on the board of the Pacific Southwest Regional Council of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. His work extends to housing policy and advocacy, ensuring that communities across California Nevada, Oregon, Arizona, and Hawaii have access to affordable housing solutions. Beyond his professional achievements, Lester is an author. His first book, Weak Start, Unapologetic Present, documents his family history and offers profound insights into life during the Jim Crow and segregation periods in North Carolina. It is absolutely a must read. It will spark deep conversations about the past and its relevance today. His latest book called Inspirational Moments, Open and Meaningful Conversations with God, further showcase his ability to connect with his audience on a personal level, offering reflections that inspire and uplift. Today, I figured I would start with a conversation regarding his first book, Weak Start, Unapologetic Present, just because I know how insightful the book and his conversation will be about growing up in North Carolina and some of the profound insights and connections to what is currently happening in the world today. So please join me in welcoming Lester Patrick. Okay, Mr. Patrick, you and your journey are truly inspiring. I'm just really excited about the book that you took so much time to put together. Can you share some of the defining moments which shaped who you are today? And like, how did growing up on a tobacco field influence your perspective and resilience for hard work? Okay, that's a... Excellent question. And, and the tobacco fields did put a lot of inspiration because it was so rough. I spent every summer working in the tobacco field the time I was 10 or 11 years old. And I worked on the farm doing what was called putting in tobacco. I don't know if you're familiar with that term or not. But the activity continued until I graduated from college. I didn't think that was going to happen, but it did. North Carolina was considered to be the world's tobacco capital. 
when I grew up. And in the county, Kitt County, where I live, so we were the tobacco capital of the world. So tobacco was first introduced in North Carolina, believe it or not, by the slaves. When they were brought to North Carolina, tobacco came along with them. And the slave traders took them from the western parts of the continent of what are now the African countries of the Congo, Nigeria, Togo, Mali, and Cameroon. My ancestors were from Nigeria, Togo, and Mali, uh, which are the places that the uh, slave traders brought them when they brought them to the Atlantic coastal areas of eastern North Carolina and Virginia. And because of the climate, the tobacco became a really profitable crop because of the climate. And this, it didn't last very long is because the farmers were able to see how profitable tobacco could be. Oh. And of course, with the free labor that came from the African slave, they started at the very beginning to treat them as slaves even though they were indentured servants. That happened almost as soon as they arrived. But yeah. back to the working in the tobacco fields. In the book, I have a section, a brief section, that I call Summer Slave Work for Black Youth. And I named it that because working in tobacco was practically the only means that African-American teenagers had make of making money during the summer in that part of the South. As soon as it became time to harvest the tobacco. Can you imagine that? And you didn't make that much money, of course, working in tobacco at all. But anyway. Wow. I, I love the detail that you give because even though I knew that people worked in the tobacco fields. You describe like the stickiness and all of the things that went with it. And I was like, wow, I didn't know. I don't really know what that was like. Oh, yeah, it was uh, terrible. And uh, I tried to relay just how bad it, it worked, including the pain that came along with your back being bent over at a uh, of 90 degree angle, most of the day, a good deal of the uh, tobacco harvesting, harvesting season. The lack of rest that you got during the summer when you worked in tobacco, because it was typical for me to have with my cousins who were older than I, we would go out onto the farm and we would uh, get prepared for going into the field at six o'clock in the morning. And imagine sometimes working to six o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Um, it was extreme. It, it was very, very bad. Yeah. So then you bring up the slaves and you talk a little bit in your book about the Black codes and the struggles for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And they're such a critical part of our history. How do you see those historical experiences connecting to the challenges we face today, particularly in maintaining voting rights and civic engagement? African rights being restricted as soon as they came here, going back as far as 1619. This took place between 1640, when the first slave law was passed, up through the 1860s. But there were slave codes that were actually implemented prior to the first slave law being in 16 passed in Virginia. Slave codes forbid slaves from owning property, from leaving their master's premises without permission, being out after dark, believe it or not, even congregating with other slaves, carrying firearms, and testing, doing things such as participating in the justice system by testifying. So if a white person, for example, was to strike a slave, then they could not respond. They could not defend themselves because it was illegal for uh, any black person to strike a white person. It's illegal to be educated. And of course, in many cases, even marrying each other. 
slave law was actually implemented in 1640. By 1660, there were severe restrictions on the movement of slaves on their rights in general. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was very bad. But I want to make a point about North Carolina. But in 1669, Article 10 of the Fundamental Constitution of the Carolinas, and I'm going to read this, stated that every free man of, of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves, of what opinion or religious soever, <laughs> was granted complete control over the lives of their Negro slaves. And one of the things that it means is that if he, if, if an owner, a slave owner, wanted to kill that slave, he was protected against him killing his slave. That was his property. So this meant the power of life and death of their slaves. Oh. So even being a Christian, and this is one of the things that they tried to use to keep slaves under control, Christianity, to justify their behavior over their slave. And to make a comment about the black, the black codes, this took place up until the mid-1800s. And the black codes, they were laws that were passed by southern states, particularly after the Civil War. And after this disruption period, to restrict a further restricting African Americans' rights. And these were in response of the Emancipation Proclamation. Because even though slavery ended legally in 1863, the former slaves still were not truly free. Mm -hmm. So this is true because very soon after the Emancipation Proclamation passage, the Southern Confederate states passed laws to institute slavery all over again. And they did this through the Black Coast. Not much changed for them during that period. And remember, the 15th Amendment has not been repealed. Just think about that. The 15th Amendment is still in place. But because of the Black Codes, the states had implemented to take away the rights given to freed slaves under the Constitution. The United States Congress passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. So they had to pass another bill. And I do mean the states had taken away the slave freedom. I'll give you another example of the North Carolina Constitution, of Section 2 of that Constitution. It described the law's purpose, and these are Black Code laws and Jim Crow, as making freed slaves subject to the same laws as they were subject to before their emancipation. Those laws, of course, were slavery. It had one intent, and that was to counteract what had been passed by Congress and then make them slaves again. You have to ask the question, could it happen again? The answer is absolutely, it could happen again. And I want to read section two of what it, from the Constitution of what it said. All persons of color who are now inhabitants of this state shall be entitled to the same privileges and are subject to the same burdens and disabilities as by the laws of the state were conferred on or were attached to free persons of color prior to the ordinance of emancipation. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. So section two is uh, so important because it applies to all enslaved people who had been emancipated by the, in 1863. But again, these laws, these reconstruction laws, which is what they were called, the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment, they had not been repealed. But at the state level, they had uh, simply been ignored. So the question of whether or not it could happen again, the answer is absolutely yes. But even worse, what if we had a president who was willing to simply make 
an order. executive order, simply an executive order to reinstitute slavery. You think about that. Is that even and possible? It was not what we're talking about right now. Because again, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments had been passed. They were ignored by at the state level in favor of those laws that uh, and these were the Jim Crow laws. The 15th Amendment gave uh, male slaves the right to vote. And the amendment was ratified in 1870. And uh, yes, it could happen again if Congress decides to do it. You mentioned earlier about the struggle of voting, intimidation, African-Americans and white voting coalitions. This is really important because the slaves got the right to vote in 1870 until after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1966. And even in 1966, they could not exercise their rights fully without intimidation. This, this is really important. So as a result, in, in the 1898 state election, as many as 80% of all of the eligible Black voters participated in the state election. 80%. Now, this caused the Democratic Party to beef up its white supremacy campaign. And this effort was similar to what we see today in modern-day Republican Party. And the same thing today across the country with voter suppression. Only then it was much more intense and extremely violent. The paper sponsored regular addresses and newspaper articles appealing to white voters about Negro domination, about black men raping white women, and other fear mongering. And it's very much like what is done by Republicans today when they degrade African American voters by, by accusing them of cheating. And much like accusing people of African descent of eating their neighbor's pets. Same derogatory attitudes. Like the previous president in tweeting nasty and demeaning things that we know that he tweeted about black people in public when he was president. It's all the same thing, just different people. The Democrats uh, in 1898 devised a plan to attack the city of Wilmington. And this was if Blacks were to be successful in keeping control of the local government in Wilmington because of the Republican and Black coalitions that had formed. So Wilmington then was the most highly populated city in the state. And it had a sizable Black population and a Black newspaper. Consequently, the Black newspaper editor that the News and Observer was where they were calling black men rapists. They responded through news articles accusing white women of initiating the sexual contact. This angered white Democrats greatly. Meanwhile, the white supremacy campaign of the Democrats was very successful and resulted in the party winning overwhelming share of the districts across the state. In Wilmington, in 1898, Blacks and Republicans combined to control all Wilmington elected offices. And in response, white Republicans' uh, uh, success and recently freed Blacks in Wilmington in the local election, the white supremacists on August the 10th, 1898, attacked and burned the office of the Black newspaper, the Daily Record. And... Oh. The attack resulted in killing 36 blacks. All elected officials were forced at gunpoint to resign and run out of town. Democrats filled all with hand-picked white supremacists. And this event placed fear into the hearts of blacks in North Carolina and for a very long time. And it had a tremendously negative impact on voter participation for years to come. As an example, in 1896, they were registered to vote. How uh, strong the impact was 
of the Wilmington Massacre or Insurrection. There were 125,000 Black men registered to vote and make Black just six years later. In 1902, there were only 6,000. Wow. Only 6,000. And they were fearful, uh, especially since both the federal and the state government stood by and won no intervention whatsoever. They just allowed the white supremacists to come in and do whatever they needed to do to put themselves in office. But an example of a government takeover with government support. Oh, wow. Yeah. And well, how come we never hear about this one? That's my, And that's why I wrote about it. Yeah. Because it's not the only place that this happened that are little known historical facts. Some people don't want us to know this history, but we need to know it. Yeah. We need to, because some people uh, erroneously believe that this is something that could happen again. And I've said it a couple of other times. The, the Reconstruction laws were never repealed. They were always in place constitutionally for those things, to vote, to participate in and to congregate in public facilities and whatever you, whatever we wanted to do. But the state laws prevented that from happening. And that is what we had better be aware of today. Because the attitude today of many see this happen again. And that is the reason that you have not heard about it. But it's real. But the bottom line is that even with the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1966, segregation was still very prevalent. When I graduated from high school in 1968, my high, uh, the high schools were still segregated. And you think about it, Congress had already passed the Civil Rights Bill in 1866. 1866, yeah, and 100 years later, we still had not obtained true citizenship. Uh -huh. Even though the Reconstruction laws were, were part of the Constitution. And this was all done in the name of Jim Crow. And shockingly, there are Jim Crow laws still on the books. When I grew up, Jim Crow laws were still on the books. And even today, there's Jim Crow laws still in the Constitution of North Carolina. Yes, there's a literacy requirement in the Constitution of North Carolina today. And they have voted on it, but and I should also say that there are Jim Crow laws part of many states' constitution, including California. It was put there in response to 80% of eligible Black voters participating in the 1898 election to deter them from being able to participate. A literacy law, because most of the African American could not read well, nor could the white. But what they would do, it, it wasn't just that a black person could not read. They would give them very difficult material to demonstrate whether or not they could read. And even the ones who could read, just could not read what they gave them to demonstrate. So it was just like today with the voter registration for African-Americans in inner city who sometimes require things like hunting license. Same situation then and today. Wow. So, yeah. So. That's amazing. Yeah. So I don't, I'll just say a couple of things about Jim Crow etiquette. Okay. Because there was a Jim Crow etiquette. There were the laws, the Jim Crow laws, but then there was the expected behavior. So if you didn't 
exhibit the behavior that was expected. They threw the law at you. They, uh -huh. they, they used the law to enforce it. And, and I'll just on a couple of them. For example, it was a law that a black male could not offer his hand to a white male to shake hands it, or something. It implied that they were socially, and in their view, they were not. And the same thing about offering his hand to a white woman or anything else. He could be accused of rape. Blacks and whites were not supposed to eat together, for example. But if they did, there had to be a petition, a curtain or something separating them. And the white people had to be served first. That was the law. Wow. So, let, let me tell you something. That was Another law was that white people had to run right at an intersection. Can you imagine that? White people had the right of way. Even if the light was red or green or whatever? It didn't matter. If you were white, you had the right of way. That, and that's my point. That was so dumb. <laughs> As all of, but yeah, they had the right of way. If you were walking on the sidewalk, for example, and a white person was walking on the sidewalk, the law stated that you were required to get off of the sidewalk so that the white person could pass. And I know these were some of the same laws that we saw in different countries in Africa as well, right? That's right. They got them from us. Yeah. <laughs> in South wow. Africa, they got them from us and they wow. implemented them there. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. It was Maxine Waters. Mm-hmm who had asked him a tough question, bond to, he called her the dumbest woman in the world. And, right. Yeah, the dumbest intelligent. And he'd only do that to a black woman. But the point there is that she could not have asked him a question like that or any other question in public that could embarrass him. Or that could be a difficult question. She could not have done that under Jim Crow. It was illegal. There, wow. was, a, there was a law against it. But he's demonstrating modern day Jim Crow etiquette because he expects it to happen. He expects her to respond to him the same way she would have during the time when Jim Crow was legal. Same thing with LeBron James. I'm sure you remember when the things were going on between Donald Trump and LeBron James. Because LeBron James had built a school to educate minority kids. Isn't that crazy? But again, Jim Crow, modern day Jim Crow etiquette. LeBron James not behaving the way that he wanted him to behave. And he would have during Jim Crow, he could have just shut the, the school down. But now... I don't love the what you're saying, but I love the fact that there's so much history here that people need to know about. It's incredible how much we don't know about our own history. We'll wrap it up today, and then I'll circle back with you, because I would love to hear even your take on like your military service and technology yeah. and artificial intelligence and all of that. So oh, okay. it's yeah. got a lot of history in there. And just, there were so many things that I was like, wow, this is what's happening today. It right, was right. just the continuity of information that you're presenting, which is from years ago, but it's, that's happening today. That's why I wrote it. And yeah. I'm glad you recognize that. That's exactly why I wrote it. Yeah. It's amazing. But I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I look forward to your next book coming up as well. Okay. <laughs> very, very good. Yes. I'll circle back with you and we will set up some more time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining me on the Jolly Podcast. Please subscribe so you won't miss an episode. See you next week.